Hello, everybody. Welcome to Open Education Week. This session is titled An Introduction to 4.0 for Education. And of course, what we're talking about are the Creative Commons licenses, which are now moving into version 4. And we want to have a look at what those, uh, what those changes are and why, as educators, we care about any of it. And so we're going to, uh, that'll be the discussion for today. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, everybody knows how to use the chat window. If you look in the lower left hand corner of your screen, uh, if you would all type in where you're from, that would be helpful. Maybe where you're from and your interest in Creative Commons licensing. And that way we can get to know each other a little bit better and we'll all learn to use the chat window at the same time. <laughs> I'm going to apologize in advance. I am on the tail end of uh, fighting a cold, so I apologize for that. Uh, I have my, my trusty coffee ready to uh, keep me in line. <laughs> so uh, before we get started, I'm going to share uh, a bit of good news that uh, coincides with Open Education Week at Creative Commons. And uh, with our partners around the world, we have launched the School of Open. <laughs> and if you look at the uh, chat window, you'll see the link for that. This is a the blog post on Creative Commons that we just posted. The School of Open is a uh, free set of learning opportunities, of professional development opportunities for you and your colleagues about open stuff, about open licensing, open access, open data, open science, open government, open policy, open courseware, <laughs> whatever you might want to learn or have others learn about open, that's the idea of the School of Open. This is a, uh, a school on the peer-to-peer -peer university platform. So there's the blog post. Here is <laughs> here's the school itself, and I'll put that link in there too. Um, this is a, a place for you to go and learn uh, in very small bites about things that you may not be expert in, in open, and you want to learn some more. So for example, uh, I, um, I know quite a bit about open educational resources as the director of global learning at Creative Commons, uh, and I'm pretty good at open policies as well, uh, publicly funded resources being openly licensed. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm about this deep when it comes to open data and open science. And I know a little bit more about open software, but I could really use an education. So the idea is all of us can, uh, can learn more as people who are interested in open, uh, who are open advocates around the world. And I would encourage you to uh, share the good news. If you look at that CC blog post, uh, what you'll find is uh, is uh, resources on how to uh, share the good news about the School of Open. So we, uh, we held that launch until Open Education Week. We wanted it to be uh, good news for everybody. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video. <coughs> and that way, uh, we'll reserve the bandwidth for audio. I should come through a little bit clearer for those of you that might have some, uh, some network difficulties. <coughs> and then, uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, go ahead and move through these slides. Uh, let me say from the outset this is being recorded. Uh, the recordings uh, from my session this morning on the Open Policy Network uh, and uh, on this session will be available on the Open Ed uh, Week website uh, on the, uh, the respective pages. Uh, our friends at the Open Courseware Consortium uh, will, uh, will make those uh, available. and. Um, and uh, we will uh, we'll go from there. I will also make these uh, slides available up on slideshare.net, and we'll get those linked uh, as well on the on the website if you if you find those slides useful. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, as, as you've got questions, feel free to uh, either raise your hand <coughs> and uh, grab the microphone, or you can just type your questions in the chat window, and uh, and we'll pick them up there as well. And uh, so we'll go ahead and dive in. For, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Creative Commons, uh, in a very short nutshell, uh, Creative Commons 
is a nonprofit organization that is now 10 years old. And what we do is we uh, create uh, open copyright licenses that are free and uh, make it easy and legal to share uh, content, music, pictures, art, educational resources, textbooks, data, you name it. If it's digital and can be shared on the Internet uh, and it's copyrighted, you can put a Creative Commons license on it. And so when we talk about uh, open educational resources, uh, we mean two things when we say that. Uh, the first is that it, the resource is available for free. It's available at no cost. Uh, but that's not enough to make it open. You must also have the legal rights to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute that resource. And if you don't have the legal rights to do those things, it is not an open educational resource. And so typically what's done is people put Creative Commons licenses on their educational resources. That makes them open and it makes them both free and openly available. Of course, uh, Creative Commons has a whole suite of licenses uh, and the no derivatives licenses do not qualify for open educational resources because uh, they don't let you change the resource. And of course, as educators, that's one of the things that we need to do and want to do is to be able to modify uh, resources. So uh, there's a quick introduction. If we <laughs> need to dive into it in more detail, we can certainly do so. Uh, but I would also point out there are other sessions uh, in Open Education Week which solely focus on uh, Creative Commons licensing and, uh, and making sure that uh, the people know what that is. So University of Delaware says it well. Gratis is not enough to be open, Libre is needed. So gratis is free access and free is good, but free is not open because free is simply uh, the, the free access to it and the ability to access and read the resource, but you don't have uh, the Libre rights. You don't have the freedoms and the legal permissions to make changes. Okay, <laughs> before I jump in, um, I need to remind us uh, that these activities that we um, that we all take part in and that we uh, that we work on uh, these openness activities um, are not always easy uh, and they come with uh, negative repercussions for some of our team members around the world. So this is a picture of a gentleman named Basel. <laughs> this Friday, Basel will have been in prison in Syria for one year. Uh, no charges have been brought against him. Basel is a longtime volunteer for Creative Commons, and he's been the leader of the Creative Commons affiliate in Syria uh, for many years. And his imprisonment is a reminder to all of us that we're not only working on a freer Internet, but we're fighting together for a freer world. Uh, Basel's crimes were helping people learn how to share and uh, sharing ideas and knowledge uh, freely uh, and under open licenses. That's why this gentleman and this friend and colleague of ours uh, is in prison. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go to freebossel.org. There's a whole organization that is seeking to, uh, to continue to support him. And uh, ultimately, obviously, our goal is to try to help Bossel uh, get out of prison. So um, I don't mean to put a downer on it, but I do mean to, uh, to let it remind us all that this is serious business uh, that we're engaged in. And we are, in fact, uh, we are all working on new ideas that sometimes threaten existing structures. It doesn't mean that these ideas are wrong or not important, uh, merely that they are, uh, they are critical. So, uh, with that, um, let me go ahead and jump into Creative Commons and the 4.0 licenses. <laughs> this, of course, is the next evolution of CC licenses, and we want to make sure that all of you understand uh, what's happening in those discussions and, and let you know that uh, this has been a completely open and transparent process, and in fact, the discussion period is still open on the licenses. So if you see something that you'd like to comment on or chime in, that process is still wide open, and you are welcome to contribute. Uh, let me grab a link here real quick. <coughs> I 
and I'll put that back in the chat window. Uh, here is the, the latest and greatest draft. It's called Draft 3. Uh, and the discussion information uh, and how to join the discussion is listed there. So if you're interested in this and want to become more involved, that's the place to go. So let me uh, just start here. Uh, Creative Commons, uh, our mission statement identifies our role around legal and, uh, and the technical uh, lead that we provide around open licensing uh, in the world. <laughs> and it really speaks to why uh, we are, uh, why we take the role that we, that we do. Uh, we are the steward of the Creative Commons licenses and our goal, our mission is to develop, support, and steward these legal and technical tools that we have to maximize digital creativity, sharing, and innovation all around the world. And in fact, uh, after a decade, there are compelling drivers for versioning uh, our licenses from version 3 to version 4, and we'll talk in detail about what that looks like. But before I dive into version 4, it's worth <coughs> taking a moment, and I will, um, all these notes I'll drop in the chat window as well so that you can, you can see them. It's worth uh, taking a moment to look at the history of Creative Commons licenses and recognize that uh, throughout the last 10 years, we've in fact made changes to the licenses uh, based on feedback from the global community to make sure that the licenses were in sync with, uh, with legal uh, copyright laws around the world and with the needs of the open community. So, for example, <laughs> excuse me, still fighting that cold. Um, so each prior version of our licenses have served important needs. So, for example, from version 1 to 2, let me go ahead and just uh, drop this in the chat window so you've got this as well. There you go. Probably more text that you wanted, but I'll, I'll hit the highlights. So from version uh, 1 to 2, what we learned is that uh, there was really no demand for licenses that did not require attribution. So attribution now is required in all the CC licenses. And attribution means if you use my stuff, you have to give me credit. Um, and that's something that the community simply said, look, that's just the right thing to do. That's what we do, uh, and just speaking in education, that's what we do in education. We use somebody else's work, we give them credit. It's, it's simply right. So in fact, we, we dropped all of the non attribution licenses from the suite as we moved to version 2. Another thing we did in version 2 is we dropped the idea of affirmative representations and warranty. So a warranty uh, essentially says if you use this thing, so think about when you buy a car, uh, you get a warranty on your car and what the manufacturer is saying to you is we guarantee, we warranty that this car will work in a certain way for a certain period of time. And what, what uh, copyright holders, what licensors told us around the world is that they, <laughs> in most cases, did not want to, uh, to give a warranty uh, on their work. They wanted to say, here's my textbook or here's my course, and I don't provide a warranty. Here it is. It's free. You can modify it. You can use it. But I don't guarantee anything about the quality of it or how it's going to work or whether or not you can open the file, et cetera. Um, I don't want that additional responsibility. So we dropped those affirmative uh, representations and warranties. The other thing we did is we, we improved the attribution requirement, uh, specifically around music and other areas. <clears throat> so that was kind of the first set of learnings from one to two. From two to three, um, there was a, that was the next major upgrade in, in CC licenses. And uh, one thing that, was, that we heard from the um, yeah, exactly, an as-is clause, right? You take this uh, as-is, buyer beware. Uh, from two to three, uh, there were several uh, major upgrades as well. One was this idea of endorsement. So uh, people around the world who were kind enough to put a CC license on their education works, they said, you know, I'm happy with, <coughs> excuse me, I'm happy with somebody taking my work but I don't necessarily endorse the way that they're using it or the way that they've changed it. So I live in Washington State. We built this big open course library of, of uh, community college courses, and the University of Maryland might want to take those courses and modify them, uh, but they might do something that, you know, maybe the, the community colleges in Washington don't think is a good idea. 
And so they don't really want to endorse it, although they're fine with Maryland taking those courses, modifying them, et cetera, giving proper attribution. Um, but it may be that the, um, that the licensor, the, in the community colleges in Washington in that case, said, you know, we really don't want our name associated. We don't want to get attribution uh, because we don't like what you've done with our work. And so we made it possible in the licenses to uh, request that attribution be removed. And so that's always an option for licensors. And that, that, uh, that made it uh, essentially gave some peace of mind for folks who said, you know, I'm not, I'm worried that somebody might take my work and do something bad with it and I don't want my name attached. And the answer is fine. You can request that your name be removed uh, if you're not happy with, uh, with a derivative work that's produced. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, that's a requirement that you can place on downstream users should you choose to do so. Now, I should say that doesn't happen very often. It's a very rare case, but it is a peace of mind to know that you've got that authority should you choose to use it as the licensor, as the, the owner, the author of the work. Another thing, uh, a big thing that happened was the internationalization of the licenses. So, of course, there's uh, copyright laws uh, in every country around the world, and we work very hard with uh, the best lawyers around the planet uh, to make sure that the licenses are harmonized with the copyright laws and the international conventions that they are party to, uh, and this includes all of the countries uh, in the world. So uh, Creative Commons, in addition to that, actually has teams of people. We call them affiliates, Creative Commons affiliates, in 70 countries around the world. So yes, the Creative Commons headquarters happens to be in Southern California, uh, but that's just one small part of this large Creative Commons network. Uh, and we've got, uh, so as these licenses are being versioned to version four, this is a global effort and a global conversation to make sure the licenses continue to work everywhere and work to meet the needs of all jurisdictions around the world. And the reason that's so important is you want to make sure that if you live in Shanghai and you are opening up your course or your textbook, you want to make sure <coughs> that somebody in uh, South Africa or England or, uh, or Russia is able to take your work, use it, and that, it, uh, that they're complying with, uh, with the copyright laws uh, that apply in, in their country and yours. Another thing that we looked at was compatibility, uh, moving to three, to really make sure that, uh, that our licenses worked with other open licenses um, uh, that, were, that were out there. Now, certainly Creative Commons licenses are the default uh, when you're talking about uh, open educational resources, uh, and they are around the world. Um, but there are other licenses like the GPL license or the free art license is another one. And we are constantly making sure that our licenses legally interop interoperate with those so that you as an educator, if you go out and you find something that's under a, a different license, you, we want to make sure that you can legally remix something that's got, say, a free art license on it and something that's got a Creative Commons license on it. Uh, so the big question is, uh, why move to 4.0? What was wrong with the three licenses? Why do we need to version up? So there, the answer is there are uh, several reasons. <coughs> the first one is internationalization. So uh, obviously Creative Commons uh, wants everybody everywhere to be able to leverage our licenses and uh, make sure and feel confident that they work in their country. <laughs> and while <laughs> CC licenses do work everywhere, um, their uh, Creative Commons has this long tradition of porting its licenses. So if you look at Creative Commons uh, webpage and you click on get a license, what you'll see on the license chooser is you can actually select different countries from around the world, and those are the ports of the CC licenses. Now, our, we, we also have an international license, which most people use. And that's the default. And that does work everywhere in the world. But uh, some countries uh, over our history have said, you know, we've got slight nuances uh, in our copyright law in our nation, and we'd like that reflected in our license. Uh, and we also 
uh, you know, want to have our flag on it and we want it translated into the primary languages in our country so that people can read the license and can understand it. Um, and so there are approximately 60 jurisdictions around the world that have, that have ported the CC licenses uh, in version 3. Uh, but that's 60 out of 196 plus or minus countries in the world, which leaves about two thirds of the world, two thirds of the world that don't have a ported <coughs> license. So Del uh, University of Delaware asked, how important is it to localize the license? So that's really the the question that's being debated right now, <coughs> as we're considering whether or not the 4.0 licenses uh, should be ported. So there are several important localization issues um, that are critical. One of them is translation. And whether or not the licenses are ported in 4.0, they will absolutely be translated into languages all around the world, just as the, the 3.0 licenses have been. And in fact, that's one of the major roles of the CC affiliates around the world is to translate uh, all of the CC licenses into local languages. Right, so that's, that's absolutely uh, critical. <laughs> but this question about uh, legal code, can the legal code be made neutral enough uh, and follow the international conventions and be harmonized with the copyright laws in the countries around the world uh, to a point where we truly could just have one set of international licenses? Now that's still an active conversation. That's still an open question. It may be in the end that the uh, that the heavy users uh, and the Creative Commons affiliates in particular around the world say, you know what, we still want to port the licenses, and that may be where it, where it comes out. Um, but that is um, a discussion that's, uh, that's, that's being actively discussed right now. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and move on to the next uh, big change. So the next one is uh, what's called a sui generis database rights. <laughs> now this is not something we have in the United States. Uh, many countries don't have this, but the idea is uh, can you license uh, the data and can you license the structure of a database? Now in the European Union, the answer is yes, uh, you can, and they call it sui generis uh, database rights. Historically, Creative Commons has focused on copyright licenses, uh, and we took great care in the past to really focus our attention uh, on copyright in particular and took great pains to kind of avoid other neighboring rights to, to copyright, including the sui generis database rights, even though European nations said, well, wait a minute, these are really important and we want to use Creative Commons licenses on database, databases. Um, others around the world said, uh, well, we don't license databases, and there was a big discussion. And in the end, in 3.0, uh, we opted not to include uh, sui generis database rights in the CC licenses. So that was a decision. Uh, in the past several years, we've felt the consequences of that decision. And the consequences, frankly, have been that many governments in the EU uh, and the EU itself have looked at uh, licensing and wanting to license database rights. And they looked at Creative Commons licenses and said, well, we can't use your licenses, and so what we're going to have to do is go create uh, new licenses. And so the result there is that specialized data and database licenses have proliferated. Now, this may not sound like a major problem, uh, but it is. And this causes uh, confusion, among other things, about what licenses are best for which types of content and materials, and it's starting to create silos of incompatible data and content that cannot be remixed and reused together. And so, uh, you know, the Creative Commons community essentially said, okay, hear you loud and clear, we will fix this in 4.0, and the 4.0 license suite will address sui generis database rights uh, in addition to copyright and similar works covered in earlier versions. And so this is good news because now uh, folks in, in Europe that uh, do want to license sui generis database rights will be able to do so with the uh, Creative Commons 4.0 licenses. And to be very specific, this may be more nuanced information than you want, so I'll keep it short. Um, but 4.0 <coughs> will make it clear 
that these permissions apply to works that otherwise would be restricted by sui generis database rights. And this applies only if two things are true. So, so the database rights will apply uh, if, one, when the law of a jurisdiction has adopted the sui generis database rights applies to the creation. So usually when the database was created by a person or an entity that's in a legal jurisdiction that recognizes sui generis database rights. So if you're in the European Union and you're building a database and you want to apply sui generis database rights, then yes, number one applies to you. If you're in the United States, which doesn't have sui generis database rights, then it doesn't apply to you. And then second, if you're using the database in a jurisdiction which recognizes those rights, then the sui generis database rights will also apply to you. So if you're not into databases or too worried about that, this isn't something that's probably a big deal to you. <laughs> but if you're an educator who deals a lot with uh, research and data and scientific research in particular, then this will matter. Be and this is good news because what this will mean is that if you're in a country that is producing a lot of data uh, and you also and you want to remix that data or uh, you know combine that data with data that's coming out of uh, EU databases that have these sweet generous database rights, the good news is now everybody can use the CC 4.0 licenses and you'll be able to remix and give proper attribution to those to those databases and respect those rights. That's essentially what it means. <laughs> so what we're trying to do essentially is to break down uh, that silo that exists today and to reduce the proliferation of licenses which are confusing the database space. Okay, uh, next one is uh, international governmental organizations <coughs> just like education institutions and governments around the world have started to say, hey, we too want to put a Creative Commons license on our works. So for example, UNESCO or the OECD or the World Bank, these, these entities have massive stores of content. And in many cases, they want to share that content with the world and they want to be more than just free, they also want to be open. And they want to use Creative Commons licenses. Um, but they've got a particular challenge, and that is that they are not subject to the uh, courts of any particular uh, jurisdiction, any particular country. They rise above that. These are intergovernmental, they're international organizations. Uh, and so they've got particular needs around arbitration if there's ever um, a disagreement in the use um, of a work or if a license has been violated. And so um, we are seeking to address their concerns in the Ford Auto licenses. And we are also and have been now for almost a year working with those uh, international governmental organizations to port the 3.0 licenses so that they can adopt those as well. And so just as there's uh, a UK port for the 3.0 licenses, uh, hopefully if, if everything goes well, there will be an IGO port of the 3.0 licenses. Why does that matter to us as educators? Because if UNESCO openly licenses all of its content and reports, et cetera, that's a whole new trove of educational resources that we can use in colleges, universities, primary and secondary education schools around the world. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one here. So um, another reason that we took a look at 4.0 was simply that, uh, hey, it's been a decade. So um, we just had our 10th birthday uh, on December 12th of last year, uh, and we felt as an organization, as a community, that it was time to really step back and take a critical look uh, at the license suite and just ask ourselves what's, uh, what can be approved, what can be made better, uh, sort of a continuous improvement goal, right? We want to we want to all get better and we want to listen to each other and we want to make sure that these licenses are as effective as they can be in the 21st century moving forward. <laughs> and this of course takes a significant amount of work uh, from, uh, from hundreds of people all around the world. And so this is not something we take lightly. 
and it's not something that we're going to do every single year either. Uh, this is probably a once in a five year uh, refresh operation, and so we wanted to make sure it was done it was done right. Okay, so moving on. Uh, specifically, what do we care about as educators? Well, there's there's several things, <laughs> and let me uh, first uh, put forth the caveat, as I said, that uh, the licenses have not yet been released. This is still an open comment period, and so all of this is subject to change. But what I'm <coughs> about to go through here is that uh, it are points that have been pretty much tied down because they've been talked uh, about for a year, and the community has really gelled uh, around a lot of these uh, a lot of these points. So let me look real quick here. Um, Igor asks, is it possible to relicense resources under different versions of CC licenses with 4.0? It's a great question. Uh, currently, and always, uh, you always have been able to uh, relicense your works under a CC license. So even under 3.0, um, I could release my open textbook under a CC BY license, and then later I could say, ah, you know, I really want to put it under a BY SA license. I want to add the share alike clause and I can relicense my work. It's also true that Creative Commons licenses are irrevocable, meaning that once you release your work under a CC license uh, and it's out there in the world, um, forever people can use uh, that license uh, under those terms as long as they comply with the license. So yes, you can relicense, but you can also never pull back existing works under existing licenses uh, because they're out there. And that's, that's by design. Uh, you know, if somebody has adopted a textbook, for example, uh, you don't want to yank the rug out from underneath them, um, but you also might want to relicense in the future. It's also true, Igor, that you could, uh, if you have your works licensed under 3.0, uh, as the copyright holder, you certainly can relicense those works under the 4.0 uh, licenses and, uh, and make sure that uh, you're under the, the most current version of the licenses. So all those things are possible. <laughs> so, what's new in 4.0 that we, that we uh, care particularly about uh, as educators? Well, the first one, and I'll go through these in greater detail in a moment, but the first one is that uh, attribution requirements have been greatly aggregated and simplified, and we're seeking to provide more flexibility uh, in such that all requirements are subject to, quote, reasonable to the means, medium, and context standard. So let me put that in the chat window here. So I'll, I'll talk more about this, but the punchline on that one is we want to make it easier for people to give attribution so that they will give attribution. Because of course, one of the, the legal responsibilities of people who are using your CC licensed stuff is that they give you attribution. And if it's difficult, and it's hard for them to do, they're less likely to do it. And so the global community said, we've, we've got this collective interest in making attribution easier to do so that people can be compliant with the terms of the license. <coughs> that's number one. The second two here are really no changes, but that's significant because there was a lot of discussion about whether or not to change them. And so uh, share alike, there was significant uh, discussion around whether or not the essay provisions should be strengthened. So let me be specific about what that could have meant for education. In education, so I'll use our friends from the University of Delaware as an example, um, Delaware, um, as it produces an open course, for example, probably what they're going to do is they're going to look all around the world and they're going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and they're going to borrow a course from Washington's open course library and they're going to take an MIT open courseware course and they're going to take one from Open China and they're going to take one from the Open University of England and they're going to take something from South Africa and all these things are going to have Creative Commons licenses on them. And what they're going to want to do is uh, then add some of their own content and they're probably going to want to make changes to some other people's content. If any of those pieces of content had a share alike license in it, <laughs> what you can do today, and what you'll also be able to still do in 4.0, is you can take that work and you can sort of pull these, pull these things together 
as a collection or as a grouping of content. And you can treat those different pieces as kind of chunks of content in your course. And the share alike provision in, say, the MIT open course doesn't necessarily infect the rest of that University of Maryland course with share alike because you've, you've left it as a discrete object, you've properly marked it, and you've not remixed it uh, directly with all of the other content in the course. You've taken maybe a chapter out of an OCW course from MIT, and you've said, there it is, that's, that's an MIT chapter, and then over here I've got a chunk from South Africa, and the rest of the course we built at the University of Maryland, and we've put a CC BY license on it. That's called a collection. And what you've been able to do under CC licenses is to have essentially incompatible uh, CC licenses hang together in a work like that, in a course, without having share alike infect everything else in the course. That's been very helpful to the University of Maryland to put together the course that they want to put together and use all the different pieces of other people's CC license stuff without saying, well, look, the whole course now has to be share alike. Uh, you also know that um, some CC licenses simply cannot be remixed with other CC license stuff. So this ability to put together a collection is really, really important for educators. And in fact, a lot of the open courseware that's out there is collections of stuff. Uh, the discussion around share alike was, should we strengthen share alike so that if so that those collections, in fact, would be infected with SA. What that would have done, I, I think I've already pointed out, is that had that SA provision been strengthened, uh, as educators, we wouldn't have been able to put together collections like that. And that would have been, in my opinion, a negative move. And so there was a lot of discussion about that. And in the end, uh, we decided not to expand uh, share alike. The other discussion was around uh, the non-commercial clause. Now, the punchline here is um, uh, that there were no definition changes to non-commercial. Uh, and before uh, we get into the weeds on that one, I'm going to go ahead and get into the weeds on the other two. <coughs> so, so let's get specific about attribution. And I'll go ahead and let me drop in the notes on this one. And then I'll hit the highlights. <laughs> so, as I said before, the goal here is to make attribution easier for licensees, for users of your content, while still respecting the author's rights. And that's a balancing act, right? We, that's, a, that's a hard thing to get right. And so there are these four important points uh, about what's happening in the conversation. Again, this is still open for discussion. It's not tied down yet, but it looks like it's going this way. Uh, the first change is uh, in the attribution requirements themselves. The first change is we're, we're considering not to make the title of the work required anymore, uh, but to require, uh, require that you note the modifications that you've made to the work. So what licensors around the world have told Creative Commons and the CC affiliates is, Look, what's really important to us as licensors as derivative works get made. So if I share my open textbook and then other people take my open textbook and change it, modify it, et cetera, what I really want to know is what were those modifications? What did you change? Did you translate it into a new language? Did you change chapter two? What did you do? Uh, and so I'm really interested in that as the owner of the work. Um, and so uh, modifications, the, what you did, will actually be a requirement of the, of the attribution. And so this is important for both the licensor, but it's also important for downstream users to know what changed in the work. And so that will be a very likely part of the attribution requirement. Um, as I said before, um, attribution, in an effort to make it more simple, uh, the legal language says, quote, in any reasonable manner based on the medium, means, and context in which the licensed material or adapted material is shared. So it essentially expands, there's this legal concept of reasonableness. So are you giving proper attribution? Well, what medium are you in? You know, how, what's reasonable requirement on the user to do so? Now, of course, there's lots of reasonable ways 
to do it, uh, but we, we get specific in the license and we say, for example, it may be reasonable to satisfy the attribution condition by providing a URL or a URI, a hyperlink, to the resource that includes some or all of the required information. So as a licensor, what you're going to want to do in 4.0 is to say, here's my work. It's under a CC license. And here's the, here's the source URL. Here's the link where there's information that I, that I want to be associated with this work. And so you can do that today with the CC license chooser. You can actually say, you know, here's the author, here's the source URL, um, et, et cetera. And, and that, all, that, all that information gets embedded in the CC license. So we already make that easy to do today, and then you can simply copy that code, drop it in your HTML, and it puts all that information on. You might also, just to be crystal clear, just want to say, you know, look, here's the, here's the information, here's the copyright information about the work. Um, and then provide the, the URL. And again, you can provide the URL in the license. And so the idea is that if you make it that easy, if, you, if people just have to say what license it is and then provide the link, and what they're doing is they're linking back to you, that that will increase compliance with the attribution uh, clause. So again, uh, the goal here is to make it, make it easier and hopefully more people will provide uh, proper attribution. Um, I don't think I need to say more about share alike. I, I already went into great detail on that one, so I'll skip it. Uh, Non-commercial, um, lots and lots of discussion around this, especially in education. Um, as you know, there's always questions about what's commercial use. Uh, is it commercial use if I'm charging tuition at my institution? Well, most people would say no. You're not charging for the content. You're charging for services around the content. That's fine. That's not commercial use. Go for it. But then there are these, there are these more nuanced cases where people say, well, what about for-profit educational institutions? Uh, they're not really charging for the content either, but they're for-profit, and we don't know how we feel about that. You know, well, what about uh, bookstores in a nonprofit community college? Uh, what if a bookstore wants to print a open textbook and they have to charge a little bit of overhead to pay for the lights and for the student who is checking you out at the register. <laughs> is that commercial use? Well, they didn't really make a profit on it, but they are charging money specifically for the textbook. And so obviously there's a lot of gray area and oftentimes confusion around non-commercial. Um, the advice that um, you know, that a lot of people give is to get the licensor and the licensee together and have a quick conversation. And more often than not, what we find at Creative Commons is that the person who's put an NC license on their thing is very willing to, uh, to still allow use in those edge cases that I've, that I've shared. Uh, and the licensee or the user is often very hesitant to use that NC licensed work in those edge cases. And so usually it's a very easy conversation and everybody's willing to play nice uh, and allow use and they'll send a quick email saying, yes, it's fine, go ahead and use it. The problem with that, of course, is that that's friction, that takes time, it slows up the use. And so, of course, a lot of us in education say, look, just don't use the NC license and you avoid that altogether. Nevertheless, this was a big conversation around 4.0 and really asking about what should we do in the license, if anything, around being more specific about what commercial use means, about changing the definition. And um, I'm not going to go into all the details, although I will drop all of my notes here into the chat window if anybody wants to dig deep. <laughs> There's all the nitty gritty details. Uh, but the punchline was, that um, the community decided that there should be a very high bar uh, for deciding whether or not the license should be changed. And the reason that the community decided the bar should be very high is that people, as imperfect as a confusing NC is, and it is confusing to a lot of people, um, the community has sort of worked around that confusion. They've 
figured it out. They posted on their website saying, here is what we mean by non-commercial use. And without violating any of the terms of the license, we mean it's okay to use this. So um, there's lots of good examples with Wired Magazine, or um, I'll, I'll grab a few in a minute and uh, share them, uh, where you know folks have said, look, uh, what we mean by non-commercial is we don't want you to take this thing, put it on the internet, and charge 19.95 for it. Uh, you know, we're fine with you using it in your blog posts. We're fine with you using it in your educational activities. We're fine. You know, use it any way you want. Just don't take this thing put it on the web, and sell it for money. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the bottom line was that folks said, look, if you change the definition, if you change the name of the license, you're going to screw it up. You're going to screw up all these systems we've got in place. You're going to screw up the professional development that we've done, and that's going to make everything more difficult. Um, this also was a concern with, uh, with a lot of the uh, for-profit entities that use the non-commercial license who have grown very comfortable with under their understanding of the license and the community's use of their NC license works. So for all those reasons, the bottom line is it looks like NC is not going to change. So that was a great relief to a lot of people. It was also a big disappointment to a lot of other people. Um, and But nevertheless, that, that looks like that's going to be the outcome. Uh, other 4.0 uh, changes uh, that we care about in education, uh, and let me just go ahead and drop these in the chat window. <coughs> uh, the first one is called reinstatement. And so the idea of a CC license is anybody can use your work for free, um, and they have all the legal permissions to uh, make changes, <coughs> redistribute, perform the work, et cetera. Um, make changes as long as it's not an MD license, uh, but they have to comply with the terms of the license. That's the whole point. Um, if you violate the terms of the license, so you know if it's got an NC clause and you take the thing and put it on the internet and sell it, you have violated the license, and you are <laughs> being in violation of the license. You can't use the work anymore. Uh, you've performed an illegal activity. You've, in fact, violated the person's copyright. And, uh, and you know, cease and desist. You may not use it anymore. Reinstatement means that the licensor gives you, they forgive you, and they give you permission to use it again. So um, in 4.0, uh, well, I'm sorry, in 3.0, um, there was automatic termination uh, of your rights to use it if you violated the license, and getting your rights reinstated was, uh, was more difficult. Uh, in 4.0, it includes this provision that provides a path to automatic reinstatement of the license upon the cure of the violation. So the legal language says uh, the license may be reinstated on the date the violation is cured, quote, provided it is cured within 30 days of your discovery of the violation or upon express reinstatement by the licensor. So the licensor is the author, the, the copyright holder. And so the idea here is <laughs> licensors around the world said, look, the reason we're, we're putting a CC license on, the, on our thing in the first place is we want it to get used. And we know that people are going to screw up and they're going to violate the terms of the license and nine times out of ten, they did it by accident, or they did it because they didn't understand, or they weren't paying attention. And yes, their use should cease because they violated the license, but we also want them to cure their violation. We want them to fix it. We want them to provide attribution. We want them to stop selling our thing. We want them to uh, you know, uh, put a share-alike license on their derivative work if I had a share-alike license on my work. And, and then we want them to continue to use our work uh, in the proper way. And so uh, let's make it easy for them to get reinstated. Th that, was the, that was the discussion. Uh, the next one is, is around warranties. And so uh, essentially some people said, <coughs> look, uh, we recognize that, uh, that some of us might want to provide express disclaimers uh, or limitations that are different from the license provisions. So uh, some of those include business models or, or risk portfolios 
or local law requirements where people might want to uh, provide uh, disclaimers or affirmative warranties. So I might want to warranty something that's outside of the license. Um, and 4.0 uh, simply makes it more clear and easier for, for people to do so. But this is an option of the licensor. Most people aren't going to do this. Most people are just going to say, I have the copyright. I'm going to keep my copyright, and I'm going to put a CC license on it, and they won't address warranties at all. Uh, but for those people who want to do that, it makes it easier and clearer to do so. The other thing that uh, we're going to make more uh, clear in 4.0 in the legal terms is how to uh, how licensors have, can provide additional permissions, more permissions uh, than the license already provides. So for educators, this might be useful for people who want to use a no derivatives license, but also maybe want to allow people to translate their works, which of course is a derivative work. Uh, maybe your intent, though, is to not allow people to change your work, um, but translations are okay. And so we're going to make it easier for you to be uh, consistent and compliant with the license, but to add additional permissions. Now, you've been, always been able to do this with the CC Plus protocols, uh, where you could add additional permissions uh, to the license, and we're simply going to make that more clear in 4.0. By the way, uh, just to be clear on my own personal advice, we never <laughs> advise NV licenses in education uh, because, A, they violate the OER definition, and B, uh, educators uh, like to and need to change stuff and make modifications. So if your intent is to share as an educator, uh, please stay away from the MD licenses to the extent that you're able. Uh, stay closer to the CC BY and the BY SA licenses uh, to the extent possible. Uh, other, uh, other things, let me go ahead and move forward. <coughs> kind of a heads up on, <coughs> on the timeline here. Uh, this, this final draft, uh, uh, draft three, was published in February, so the discussion has been going on. It will continue to go on this month. Uh, really, we're nailing down whether or not uh, there will be a porting. Um, the deed and the license chooser uh, will be modified to, uh, to meet the needs of the Ford Auto licenses uh, before the launch. We're having lots of conversations with big providers and platforms of CC licenses. Uh, as you all know, you know, Flickr and YouTube and, uh, you know, I'll make it easy for you to add a CC license and Vimeo and just lots of other platforms and a lot of education platforms as well. Uh, iTunes U allows you to add a CC license to your works uh, as an example, Blackboard course sites, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, we're wrapping this up. So if you have any final comments, please do join the conversation. But uh, this has been going on now for over a year, uh, the Ford Auto discussions, uh, and we will be launching in quarter two of 2013, so that's coming up very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and we're excited about that, and we hope you're excited uh, about that as well. So what's still open for discussion? Well, I already mentioned uh, porting. Uh, the attribution and marking guidelines are still open for discussion. And we're also uh, having these uh, compatibility discussions with the free art license stewards and with the GPL uh, folks as well. Again, the intent here is to make sure that there are not silos of content out there that cannot, that cannot be remixed. We want to build a world where it's easy for us as, as educators to take content from, from everywhere uh, that's openly licensed and remix it. Now, again, in education, uh, we know that, uh, that CC licenses are really the default, and, and that's a good thing, so it's easy to remix. Um, but to the extent that some communities do use these other licenses, uh, we go to great pains to make sure that, uh, that the CC licenses uh, do interoperate. So uh, here are the links. I will drop these in the chat window as well. Um, if you'd like to uh, subscribe to the listserv, this is where, <coughs> where all the activity is taking. Place. <clears throat> of course, being Creative Commons, everything we do is in the open and is openly licensed and is as transparent as, as we can make it. Uh, and then there's the Ford Auto uh, wiki site as well uh, where people can share information. Uh, of course, all of these slides and everything that we do at Creative Commons is under a Creative Commons attribution license. 
I will make these slides available in PowerPoint uh, format, so you may take them, use them, edit them, you may sell them, uh, do anything you'd like. Uh, I also want to uh, point out, as I did at the beginning, that I am not a lawyer, uh, so please take uh, what I uh, say with a, a grain of salt on a lot of these legal details. Uh, I am an educator. Uh, I, I uh, have a, a PhD from Ohio State, but it, uh, I do not have a Juris doctor, I'm not an attorney, so uh, I throw that caveat on, any, on anything that I said about legal specifics. Um, I'm giving this particular talk because I care about education, I care about everybody in the world getting access to a high quality education, and I care about <coughs> all of our governments adopting open policies so that as taxpayers, when our money is used to produce education resources or purchase educational resources, that those resources be openly licensed. And we care about that for education resources. We care about that for scientific and academic research uh, resources. And we work with our friends in the open access community and movement to ensure that as well. If you are interested in these ideas, and would like to follow this further, um, you can follow me at C Green. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, you might also want to follow at Creative Commons. I'll put that in the chat window here. Creative Commons. <coughs> there we go. And um, please do uh, please do follow us as there are updates, as we have additional information to share about the Ford Auto licenses about uh, about anything else, you'll find us uh, there. Uh, yes, I do have a Google Plus handle. You can find me on Google Plus on cable.green uh, on Google. And I've got uh, several other handles, but those are, those are probably the main ones. Um, but you know, I, I use this feed thing, what's it called, Hootsuite, and I cannot get connected with my Google Plus right now. So, um, where I'm broadcasting at the moment is to Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So <laughs> you can friend me on Facebook, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, or you can just sign up and follow me on, on Twitter. Uh, and please follow Creative Commons as well. There's my email address on the screen. Uh, if anybody uh, would, if, if you're interested in these topics and ever want me to come uh, to your country, uh, come to your institution uh, to, I give keynote speeches on open policy, on open educational resources, uh, on uh, certainly on Ford Auto, on education, uh, and anything else that you want to talk about uh, on these topics. Uh, I'm also happy to do webinars for your institutions, for your nations. Uh, we're putting together an open policy network right now to support governments and institutions as they adopt open policies. So uh, lots going on. Let me go back to the chat window here. I see there was one comment, I think. University of Delaware, I think, had a question. Well, I'll stop there. If anybody wants to grab the microphone, just raise your hand. It's just above the chat window. It looks like this, a little human hand. And, uh, and go ahead and ask your questions. And we can, you can also type them in the chat window. We've got about one minute. <laughs> Sorry about that. And as you're thinking about your questions, just a reminder, this session uh, has been recorded. It's still being recorded and will be made available on the homepage for this session on the Open Education Week website. Do you have any idea why YouTube doesn't give any other option besides CC BY or the YouTube license? Why nothing in between? Yes, I do have an idea why. So uh, many platforms uh, that have CC uh, licenses um, allow for all of the licenses to be uh, adopted. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? You want to give people a choice about which license that they want to use. That's why we have six licenses. Uh, we also, if you're not familiar, we have a public domain mark that you can put on resources that are in the public domain uh, so that they are machine readable as well. And we also have a protocol called CC0, which uh, allows you essentially to give up your copyright uh, and put your work immediately into the public domain 
Uh, so that's, uh, those are not licenses per se, but those are tools or protocols that we have at Creative Commons as well. But back to the question, why is CC BY the only license that's available in YouTube? So um, the answer is really twofold. Uh, one is that it's simple. So YouTube and Google in particular uh, like things to be very, very simple. And they don't want to give a lot of choices or options. <laughs> You'll see that in all of their tools. And so uh, to, to offer all options uh, was not attractive to them for the elegance of the design argument. The main reason, though, why they chose CC BY only is that YouTube, as we know, has many, many, many videos. And one of the, thanks, Betsy, I think I will have a drink. One of the um, ideas that YouTube had was, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if you could remix videos on YouTube? And wouldn't it be cool if we had a tool on YouTube that let you take all these CC licensed videos and remix them and make new videos and then people could share those videos and we could make it easy and, and automatic to provide proper attribution to those videos and that the remix could point back to the originals and wouldn't that be groovy? And <laughs> groovy, sorry. Wouldn't that be neat? Um, and people said, yeah, that would be really a good idea. And so uh, we all know that if somebody put an ND license on their YouTube video, you're not allowed to remix that video. And we also know that if somebody put, uh, you know, an NC uh, on their YouTube video, that might cause problems if, you know, uh, the Coca-Cola website wanted to embed your really cool remix video uh, on their website uh, to highlight something. Um, and YouTube said, you know what, we don't want to go there. We don't want all that complication. We're only going to allow CC BY as an option. And that way, there's no question. Everybody can remix. Everybody can use it for whatever purpose that they want. All they have to do legally is provide proper attribution. So, so that's the answer about YouTube. Uh, other platforms tend to uh, allow choice of license. Other questions? We're a little over time, but that's okay. I'll, we'll take a few more questions. I thought so, but thanks for clarifying. Remixing can also be done under fair use, even if for non-CC BY videos. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, if you've got fair use or fair dealing rights in your country, um, you're allowed to do uh, certain things under certain conditions with copyrighted resources without permission. Um, but of course, that carries some risk. You have to know what your rights are, and your use uh, can be contested by the copyright holders themselves. And uh, so we, as Creative Commons and as an open community, we absolutely want and need strong fair use and fair dealing rights in every country in the world. Um, but to the extent that that's not the case in many countries, um, we also need uh, Creative Commons licenses to be known and for people to uh, understand and use them so that even when there aren't fair dealing rights or fair use rights or you don't want to uh, rely on them as heavily, it's helpful to have resources that are under a, a CC license. Uh, but both are important, let's be clear. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. I don't want to hold you up uh, in case you need to hop for another session. Uh, let me thank you. Uh, be uh, grateful for your attention, and I am. Uh, and please remember, as you as educators are moving forward, uh, please do put a Creative Commons license on your works so that your genius, your ideas, your knowledge can be shared with others around the world. Uh, I wish you all well. I wish you a good day, a good evening, uh, or a good night, wherever you may be. Uh, bonsoir, uh, my friends in France, Sophie, it was wonderful to see you, and I'll talk to you all soon.